study into the loss of the Ark of God during the time of Samuel. We saw last week that when Samuel was still a young man, working under Eli the high priest, uh, he, uh, he was a good man in many ways, but he had two wicked sons that he failed to restrain, and this brought great stress upon Israel. It brought immorality upon the nation. It brought spiritual uh, declension and failure. Uh, the, the prophet pointed out Eli's sin. Uh, Eli, though he was basically a good man, uh, even in a biblical sense, uh, he had failed in, in verse uh, chapter 2, verse 29. Had, his sin was, you honor your sons more than me. If you remember, his sons had corrupted the offerings of the Lord by stealing from the offerings. And the people began to not, not to want to give offerings anymore because of the theft that was going on. And it was not a time of worship anymore for them. And not only that, but they were highly immoral that they used their office to seduce women who came to the tabernacle, which is horrible, horrible sin. Now, both of these were horrible sins. And this led to the spiritual declension among the people. Uh, Eli's failure to discipline his sons permitted the evil to permeate throughout the culture. And then when war came with the Philistines, uh, the Israelites went out to battle and they were defeated originally. They, the first time they went out, they were defeated. I think they lost, I think it was 4,000 men, which is still a significant number of men. But they were able to regroup. They came back. And they decided that they had failed to include God in their battle. But their idea was of God was just simply bringing the ark of God with them. If you remember in the Old Testament, well, uh, in, in the book of Joshua, the ark was used uh, as they walked around the city of Jericho. They uh, marched with the priests, then they blew the trumpets, and the wall falls down and everything like that. And it was the ark of God which really was the symbol of the presence of God and his victory over their enemies. So... They get the Ark of God, they go out to battle once again, but as I pointed out last week, right beside the Ark of God stood the two evil priests, Hophni and Phinehas. And these men should not have been there. They should have been disciplined, they perhaps even put to death under the law of God for the sins that they were committing. Now I'm surprised that God did strike them dead before, but he had a purpose for them. If you remember the sons of Aaron who brought strange fire to the Lord, were stricken by God himself. A fire came out and destroyed them. But these men were permitted to continue with their sin, and their judgment comes later. So they went out, which, which here we have their judgment now. They went out with the ark. The Israelites still lost the second battle, but this time it was a complete devastation. You know, it wasn't simply a military loss. They, their, their army was decimated. They fled back to their tents. The ark was taken. The priests were killed. And they were in utter defeat. You know, and this was, I believe, because they went to war thinking that they could bring God with them, and, but also keeping their sin. And they found that they could not do that. So we saw that in that lesson, God is not impressed with the outward observance of religion, but the religion of the heart. He wants a broken and contrite spirit. He's not concerned with formality in religion. He, people can go through all the, the proper steps and do everything just right and yet fail in the heart, as I mentioned this morning in the message this morning. So in keeping all the trappings of their worship and bringing the art with them, but failing to repent, they were completely destroyed and lost everything. They lost the Ark of God. Uh, to the point that Eli, though, he, when, when news came back to him, he was sitting down. He's a big, big man, and he's very old in his 90s. He gets word of, of his sons, and, and I'm sure that was a difficult thing to take. But then when he finds out about the Ark of God, he falls over backwards and breaks his neck and dies. His daughter-in-law with all this stress, is, is brought into labor. She dies in the process of having the baby, but she names the baby before she dies, and the name of the baby is Ichabod, where the glory has departed. Everything was lost at this point. So with that in mind, uh, let's pick up where we left off with chapter 5, and what we see here is the Philistines celebrating a great victory in chapter 5. Now with the total defeat of Israel, 
The Philistines were left with a great spoil of war. The very Ark of the Covenant that accompanied Joshua in his conquest of the Promised Land, which Moses, uh, under the direction of God, had built. And they had placed within the Ark of the Covenant, I believe, the uh, copy of the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod that budded, and uh, there was something else. Does anybody... I did this. The manna, right, the pot of manna. Very good, you passed the test. Now, so, now you see, all these things were in there, and this was part of the worship of Israel. Now it's gone. The enemy of God had come in and taken them. Uh, but when they, they captured this ark, they didn't destroy it. We we're not sure exactly why they didn't destroy it, but probably because they feared it greatly. Uh, they knew uh, that the ark was behind uh, the symbol, which was the symbol of God, was behind the great victories of Israel. They may have wanted to keep this ark. Maybe they thought that uh, if we just keep it and put it away, that maybe we, it'll prove useful someday if we need it. You know, perhaps they, they put it in the temple with the other gods, and they thought that, 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 hey, if it did such wonderful things for Israel, maybe it'll do the same for us someday if we're in a pinch and we really need it. Yeah, so they, instead of destroying it, they kept it. I think God restrained them, of course, at that point from destroying it. Uh, there was a, when the Babylonians came uh, many, many years later, God did not restrain the Babylonians. I believe that the ark was destroyed. I believe it was taken apart. I believe that whatever valuables were there were melted down by the Babylonians and it was gone. Uh, but that's my own personal opinion. There's some, some people think the ark was hidden. Uh, underneath the, the city somewhere in the, in the caverns, but, but there's no proof of any of that. Uh, even to the point where a movie was made, what, about 25 years ago now? Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, where the Nazis were going to capture the Ark and use, it, use, the, use its power to defeat the Allies, and Indiana Jones comes. See, even, even to this day, the Ark has some imprint upon our culture. People are still talking about it and thinking about it. Well, the Philistines had it. And uh, they were glad that they had it at first, and they thought that maybe we could use it. So what they did is they, they put it in somewhat of a, of a place of honor in their temple. Now, we're not sure perhaps if it was meant to be a place of honor, where they're adding this God now to their own gods, now that, that we have conquered the Hebrews, and that we are their masters and they are subjugated to us, we will put their God here, and we'll add that God to our gods, or perhaps... Uh, they were just putting it there underneath Dagon to say that, hey, look at this. Dagon has defeated the, the, the God of the Hebrews. Uh, whatever the reason was, they put it beside the idol of Dagon. So Dagon, if you don't know this, Dagon was some sort of a fish god. If you can try to picture like a mermaid, you know, with, with maybe a, a Philistine hat, you know, or something, and he would, well, was pictures kind of with his arms outstretched and and kind of bend, bent like a, like a fish with a fish bottom. And, and I think there was like a fish type of, of a hat on top of his head or something. And that was, was uh, the god of the Philistines who were a seagoing people. You know, being originally the Phoenician, I think descendants of the Phoenicians or somewhere, some, there's some connection to them. Uh, so they, they added this to their, their god, which any, any gods that were, were designed by the ancients I believe, were designed with demonic help. You know, we know that from the scriptures. They don't really worship their idols. They worship demons. So this is what we have here. This particular fish god was Dagon, and the ark was put there. We find that that didn't last long, though. So they place the ark in there. They come back in the morning. Maybe they're in, in there for their morning worship, or I think it's called Vespers by some people. You go in and you, you do your little worship for the morning to get the day started. And they find that, that, that the idol of Dagon is fallen down upon its face. And I said, wow, how in the world did this happen? But they didn't really think anything of it. And well, you know, these things do happen. Maybe there was something wrong with the fastening devices that we had. And, and we'll just put it back together. And so they set Dagon back up, went about their day, and uh, they returned the next day. Uh, the second night, though, Dagon did not fare so well. They came back, he was fallen over once again, but this time his head and his hands were broken off. And I think some, some Bible versions say they were cut off. 
it appears as if it was just just whacked off with, with a blade or something. You know, so they now they don't know what to do. You know, the 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 the, the their God has been humiliated before this symbol of the Israelite God. You know, but this is only the beginning, and we're going to see that God was not quite finished in teaching these Philistines, these godless Philistines, a lesson. You know, they may have defeated the people of God, but they didn't defeat God. And he's going to be bringing this out very clearly to them as we go down the chapter. But I wanted to try to, to use an application here to, to try to apply that to us today. You know, when you stop and think about it, the defeat we have here, the people of Israel were completely and utterly defeated. I mean, there was no hope for them militarily. They, they were decimated. The military was decimated. The Philistines had taken even their god, the symbol of their god, from them. Their worship was disrupted. Everything had fallen apart for them. And they were now operating as serfs to the Philistines. The Philistines would come in. They would tax them. They would, they would set up whatever they wanted to do. They, they would take their people for their armies or whatever they wanted to do. They, they were under now the Philistines. They, they were, if you can try to picture perhaps the setup of the old Soviet Union, you know, where you have the, you, the Ukrainians. Back in the day, Ukraine was just simply a part of the Soviet Union, and they operated as Soviet citizens. Now, that fell apart during uh, the time of when the Berlin Wall fell and the Soviet Union fell apart. So that's why we have the war going on right now with them. Uh, but the, 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 uh, the Soviet Union could do anything they want with them. That, they were part of their country. That's pretty much what happened here with the Israelites. Now, we live in an age today where for all practical purposes, the Christian religion has been utterly routed. You know, we, we think about it, that everything that, that our country used to stand for, at least in, in the religious sense, is now gone. Our culture is, is, is decimated. It's gone. You know, when you think just 50 years ago, 60 years ago, you know, the influence that the church had, and specifically the Protestant church had, the biblical church, I guess you could say, the church based on, on the Bible, the influence that it had in the country was very, very strong from the very beginning up until recent times. And now it's completely gone. I mean, it's gone to the point, and, and, and many of us remember, uh, especially if you watch older TV, where someone will bring out a Bible, and the Bible was treated reverently. It's even perhaps read on old television shows. You go back 50 years. You know, but in, that time, in, the, in the intervening time, it has gone from a book being respected and revered to now it's actually publicly hated. You know, and the Bible is looked at as a dangerous book. You know, that, oh, it, it, the, the Bible teaches homophobia. The, the, the Bible teaches violence. And, you know, and so, so there's this, this concept now that Christianity, instead of being something good and helpful for the, for the culture, is looked at as being dangerous. In other words, the secular, secular forces have completely overtaken our culture. Now, they did not do it through military power as the Philistines did, but I believe through an attack through knowledge and philosophy. The institutions of higher learning in the seminaries and the public schools were infiltrated by secular powers. You know, the, the public school system originally was set up by Christians. And they thought, okay, because you, you went to some of these, these towns and everybody was going to basically a Protestant church of some sort. They said, okay, well, we need to educate our kids. Well, why don't we all just get together? I mean, you have the Methodists and you have the Baptists and you have even maybe some of the Catholics. And you know, they're, all, they're all basically, at least in culture, Christian. We're going to set this up, and when we set up the education, we're going to teach the kids to read and to write, uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic, you know, taught by the rule of the hickory stick, you know, or something like that. We remember that. But then, what did they do in addition to that? They taught the basics of education to the kids, but why did they do it? For the purpose of them being able to read the Bible. You, know, you go back even to the founding of the, the country with the, the pilgrims, and they, they thought education was important so that people could be able to read scripture and as part of the curri curriculum you had the reading of scripture that some of you in here remember 
a time when the Bible was still being read at schools. Now, I'm 63 years old. I started school in 1969 in the kindergarten. I think it was, no, 69 or 60. No, 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 66. I started kindergarten in 66. Never in my lifetime in my public school education, which went through up until about the middle of 11th grade, was the Bible ever read in schools. You know, that, it was already out of the school system whenever I was, was old enough to go to school. So you see that a great victory was won by secular forces. And Christianity has been routed. There has been a hostile takeover of every aspect of our culture. Government, I mean, are we going to argue with that, that the government is now a completely secularized institution? Now, whenever you, you have at one point Jerry Nadler, who got up and said that the, the will of God has nothing to do with this body, <clears throat> you know, where right behind him there's a sign that says, in God we trust, you know, in Congress. You know, but but they, had take, they have taken power. The media, the media has become a, a great source of evil, of destruction of morals, entertainment, uh, and even the church. They say, well, wait a minute, Pastor Dollar, we're... We're meeting here, we're opening the Bible, we're trying to reverence God and worship Him. Yeah, but, but what about the main bodies that at one time were known uh, for the teaching of Scripture? You know, the Presbyterian Church, the Methodist Church, the, even, even now the Southern Baptist Church, which is, is on a precipice of falling over into uh, pro, the progressive liberal agenda. They're, they have infiltrated, and what they do is... They're not so much concerned with the people in the pews yet. They'll get to them later. What they do is they go into the educational systems, they infiltrate in, these, in, in the schools, the seminaries, and they begin teaching the pastors. The pastors do, begin to adopt these, these basically heresies and false teachings, but they're, but they're covered up enough that they're not really caught on the surface. They take them back to the congregations, and then they begin teaching the congregations, and the congregations are weakened. Uh, then to the point where the, the godless apostates are able to completely take over these institutions that at one time were Bible institutions. You know, whenever you uh, used to think of Methodists, for example, I mean, just maybe 60, 70 years ago, Methodists were known for their preaching and their Bible, you know, their Bible teaching, and Presbyterians. Now, Presbyterians, maybe, maybe years before, uh, be, be, they were known for their staunch worship, the desires to worship the Lord and to, to teach the scripture. You know, that is now gone in these mainline denominations. You know, the Methodist, think about the, the influence now. The, say, for example, the PCA church has about, I think it's 1,500 churches in it. I, I think, and it is, I think, considered one of the largest conservative Presbyterian movement or denominations of the country. I'm thinking it's around 1,500. I didn't write down the statistics. Tammy and I were talking about it. It might have been close to 2,000, but I don't think it was over 2,000. The United Methodist Church, on the other hand, has 30,000 churches. It is the, the McDonald's of churches. Every town you go into has a United Methodist Church. Now, they've gone through a pretty big split. Uh, the conservatives, what was left of them, came out, but it's going to take them a while to recover from dwelling and working with apostates for the past 60 years of their existence. But the influence that they have had permeates throughout the country. You know, I watched part of the 2024 Methodist Conference, the United Methodist Conference, and they started their meetings by introducing themselves, the person who was going to speak, by giving their, their preferred pronouns. Well, I look at the Democratic National Convention and what do you see? See, it looks just like the United Methodist Conference, which was just taken over by liberals. So you see how that influence has permeated the culture, not just in government uh, and education, but the church itself. So they've done a marvelous job of destroying our country when it comes to the things of God. The enemy has done its best to erase from our memory our Christian past. Now, you know, there's an argument that goes on. Well, we never really were a Christian nation. Well, you know, we're, we're not, it's not a Christian nation like, say, Israel was 
God's people, a theocracy. We were never a theocracy in that sense. But Christianity permeated everything that was involved in government and all of our institutions. You know, if you read the documents of our founding, for example, the Declaration of Independence, and I, this part, I, I have part of it memorized because we, and every, I don't know, maybe some of you remember, but under the, we used to have to cover our books in school with, it looked like brown paper from a, a bag, but they were actually, it had th messages on it. It had Thomas Jefferson and the, in, the Declaration of Independence. It says, we hold these truths to be self-evident <clears throat> that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Now, in other words, our rights come from God. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So our nation began with very strong Christian roots. And, you know, we think about the separation of church and state. That was for the federal government. The states still had official churches. Now they, they had, uh, I can't think of the official churches of the different states, but many of these states were, were still operating with an official church. You know, that, that uh, eventually these things all, all change. But in order for you to be in government at one point, you had to be willing... Uh, to confess the Trinity. You know, you had, and and at, so, at certain points in our history, this is how much influence that Christianity had. And you can still see that influence if you just go to the Capitol. Now, I don't recommend any more going to the Capitol, especially with what's going on. You know, I almost went to Washington, D.C. on January 6th. You know, I thought, I want to go hear President Trump speak. And I was thinking about taking off work. And, whew, boy, you know, I'm glad I didn't go. But I've been there before. And you, you walk around and you see on the buildings scripture. On these buildings that were built perhaps 70, 80, 90 years ago, some of them. You go into the, the, the capital, I think it's called the rotunda of the capital. And you have all these paintings. You know, and you have uh, the paintings of Columbus holding a cross of Christ when he discovered America. You have the pilgrims. There's a painting of the pilgrims huddled around this huge Bible. It's a very famous painting. You know, and the Bible's opened up. I'm not sure where it's opened up to. You also have a huge painting. This is right in, in, in Congress there of the baptism of, of Pocahontas. You know, Pocahontas, some people don't real, don't, maybe don't remember, uh, was converted to Christianity. You have the scriptures etched in stone all over the place. You know, in the Supreme Court building, there's a, there's a fresco, I think is what you call it. It's a, like a, a, a small engraving, like a stone engraving of different figures. One of the figures is Moses holding the Ten Commandments. This, this is, these are all through our government buildings. But the secular forces, though they have taken over the minds and, and the institutions, have not yet destroyed all of this influence of the Christian religion. Just like the Philistines or Philistines did not destroy the Ark of the Covenant. They kept the Ark of the Covenant for special occasions. Now, Christianity no longer holds the top place of honor, and it is no longer the authority in our way of thinking. It used to be, okay, well, why do we think the way we do about marriage? Well, because God said it. God said at the very beginning that he created a male and female. And our Lord Jesus says it in the New Testament. So you have the foundation of marriage in the scripture. That was settled. It was at one point. It's gone now. Uh, so, but, but we still have some trappings of our Christian past. It has been thrown down, but it is kept set aside for special occasions. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, let's see. I don't see any real young people here. Well, except maybe way at the back there. But... We all remember what happened on 9-11. You know, that, that I remember waking up for work and, and I go in, I didn't have the TV on or anything and I just went to work one morning and I'm hearing all this stuff. We've been attacked. I said, what? Who would attack the United States? It doesn't make any sense to me at all. This was back in 2000, was it 2001 when that happened? Nine, yeah, okay, 2001. Who would, would dare attack the United States? Uh, uh, on our own soil, we were attacked. What do you mean by that? And then I began to see it as it, became, as it came in. 
that the terrorists had flew in the planes in New York and destroyed the World Trade Centers. I'm thinking, whoa, I'm, that's just unbelievable that this could happen. And what happened to our country right after that? Well, people began flooding back into church. Church attendance began to rise again. And people began uh, to, to sing, I, um, what's the song? Uh, uh, what's what, that song that Lee Greenwood sings all the time. I, I have it written down somewhere. Um, God bless the USA. You know, all of this stuff, people are saying, God bless us and God, you know, and they began, uh, to, they pulled this out during this time of tragedy. But what happens? With this, just a few months of that, or maybe even weeks of this, people began to politicize everything and we all began to fall apart again. I mean, it didn't take that long. Oh, yes, God bless the USA. I have it written right here. People, all right, people are still singing that today. But anytime there's a, a catastrophe, a natural disaster uh, or, or something, or terrorist attack, they will, people, even people in government say, we need to be praying. Well, what, what are you talking about? Praying to who? You don't allow us to pray in government buildings anymore. If you're going to pray in schools, you, you've got to ship the kids off somewhere else to pray and then bring them back. And so what are you talking about? Well, they, they hold it. They, they still have that ark of God, and they, they bring it out on occasion. You know, but overall, our society has declared its allegiance to Dagon. So you say, okay, well, what way? Well, how, how do we view our origins officially? Well, it's not that we are created by God in six days, as the Bible says. We came from nothing, from some magical force that, that brought everything together, and we evolved from that one spark that apparently hit a puddle in some on the planet at one point, and we all evolved from there over millions of years. That's the official, basically, when you go to any government-sponsored institution, that's the official Dagon version of how we came to be, which makes no sense when you really think it through. But if you deny it, you are considered the idiot and you are the uneducated fool if you don't believe in evolution. And if you don't believe that, just try as a scientist to publish any papers that question, even barely question evolution and dare say anything about intelligent design. You know, and, and matter of fact, I don't know if any of you heard this, Tim Allen recently has come out and he said that I just don't see that we could get here without somebody putting us here. So Tim Allen, if you don't know who Tim Allen was, he was on uh, Home Improvement. He was uh, the voice of Buzz Lightyear in the Disney franchise. And he comes out and he, he's now trying to find God. He says, I'm reading the Bible now. <laughs> so... Uh, He's finding these things out, but don't, don't dare question it. And what's happened to his career is now his career is pretty much shot as he has now deviated from the accepted positions. Uh, but God will not tolerate second place. You know, the problem with our country is that since we began in a covenant relationship with God, our, our founders calling upon the name of the Holy Trinity in their documents for their authority, and we have forsaken it, we are under the judgment of God uh, by permitting this takeover. However, God reminds us all the time that he, he is still on the throne. Now, Dagon may be, in, may be in his temple and the ark put in a lesser place, but Dagon continues to fall over. And uh, no matter how many times the secular priests attempt to lift him back up. The Philistines found out that God will not share his glory with another. And when God decides, he interrupts their lives to remind them of his presence. You know, when they decide to keep the ark in the temple, God begins to move among them. We find that, that even after the two times they, they raised up Dagon, what happens next they break out in these tumors. We'll get to that the next time whenever uh, we meet on a Sunday evening. But the, it's believed that these may, this may have been the bubonic plague that was breaking out among them. It was a horrible, horrible thing because of, the, of what they had. They had what they had done to the ark of God. Men attempt to set up their utopias 
only to have them constantly dashed to pieces. Men think that they can set up systems that will bring on happiness for everybody, prosperity for everybody, but they don't want God. Now, so they, they continue to set Dagon up, and God continues to knock them down. Now, back when my great-grandparents were young, it was believed that all you had to do was educate people to make them better. You know, that uh, they lived before both the World Wars. They were teenagers before, uh, actually, be, before the airplane. I mean, that's, and I knew people like that. I mean, I, that's, I feel kind of old now thinking about that. I knew people who never saw an airplane. You know? But in their day... It was believed that all you had to do, you, know, you go into the cities and you see the, the problems in the cities, all you have to do is educate these people and you will change society for the better. So they set up their schools and this, the, they, they believed that these schools would bring on paradise on earth. They saw uh, through the Industrial Revolution that technology was advancing and they were now able to fly you know, the first airplane was, was invented, and they're now flying. They're now able to go from one point to another at unbelievable speeds. I mean, we think of an old airplane, you know, it doesn't go that fast. But try to picture that all you can do is, is ride a horse. You know, and, and then you have these, these cars that begin to be built, and, you know, if you went 15 miles an hour through a town, you'd be ticketed for speeding, you know, in these original cars. Uh, how, it's terrible how fast they're going, you know. But all these things are happening... And people were saying, we're going to bring on utopia. Some even believed that, the, that they were going to bring in the, the millennium, that the Lord was going to return. Then you have the medical advancement. You know, that, that uh, people were, they were developing vaccines. You, know, you, th you think of rabies. Rabies was feared. I'm horribly feared. You did not want to get rabies because you died a horrible death. You know, I've heard that, uh, of course, maybe I'm thinking of movies or something where they would tie people up that had rabies and keep them from from harming other people because of what it would do to your mind. But, but, all, but, but then they came out with a rabies vaccine. And then the advancements, advancements in food production. I mean, think about it. I mean, you're behind a mule and a plow, and that's all that you have. And you plow, plow, plow all day, and you do a couple acres. You know, I don't know how much they could have done, but now think of what they can do today. I mean, I was told, uh, st talking to a fellow at work, and he, was, he used to drive truck out west. He said they have huge tractors that run 24 hours a day producing food, uh, both when they plant and then when they harvest. That's all they do is, is they're just running all the time. And the huge amounts of food that are being produced. And people thought, we are on the verge of a complete utopia. The Industrial Revolution also produced these ships, which they believed could not be sunk. But what happens? You know, 19, was it 12, I think it was? Titanic, it goes out, this ship is, is unsinkable, boom, it sinks. It hits a piece of ice and sinks. So Dagon falls there once again. And they really thought that they, that they had everything in order and that all of humanity was, was now set for peace and prosperity forever. But then what happens? World War I, known as the Great War. You know, the nations had all tied themselves up with treaties, and uh, anarchist shoots an important person. I think it's in Serbia somewhere. Germany declares war on this person. Someone declares war on Germany, and then a boom, 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 and that spirals into complete devastation of a world war, and the, millions of people die. Yeah. Well, that war, they finally got that under control, and they thought, this was the war to what? What's that? End to end all wars. Uh, yeah, we did. Have, we had a little bubble there. Dagon fell, but we, put, we bring Dagon back up. But the people who fought in World War II, their children, ended up doing what? In World War I. They fought World War II, which was much more devastating and horrible even than World War I. Millions and millions. Then you, you have on top of that the concentration camps and you have uh, the, the Russians and the, and the Germans and the, I mean, and, the, and the Japanese and the atomic bomb and, I mean, the horrors of World War II. And they thought after that, surely, you know, Dagon fell again. We'll put Dagon back up. Now that this is all over, surely we're going to have peace. 
And then what do we have? The Cold War. And some of you remember, it was before my time, what, did, what were they teaching you? If you see that flash, what are you supposed to do? Duck and cover. Get under your desk. That desk will protect you from an atomic bomb. <laughs> you know? yeah, so people, they, they dis, they, and what is missing in all of this? Repentance. No, you, rarely does anybody ever think about, you know, maybe, if we, maybe we re need to revamp the public school system. Maybe we need to eliminate this foolish idea of evolution. And we need to clean out the atheism. And maybe we need to, to take the ark of God and put it in its proper place. Instead of allowing Dagon to have precedence over the ark of God. Maybe we ought to do that. Nobody ever thinks of that. And so what happens? They, they clean up the mess that they just made and then they just go on to make another mess, a greater mess than what they've done. So, the scripture says that there is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. So what's the solution? To repent, to stop being wicked and turn to the Lord. So Dagon was set up with the Philistines and their victory celebrations. And uh, what happens, he falls over. And so it is with us today. And I'm trying to, to find my place here where I was. Okay, so then. And there's a lot more I could say, but I think you get the point on that. Uh, the Philistines realized at this point they couldn't keep the Ark of God. I mean, we go to verse 6. You know, after all that incident in the temple with the ark and Dagon, but the hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod, and he ravaged them and struck them with tumors, both, in, both Ashdod and its territory, and so on. So I think that they finally realized the supremacy of the God of the Hebrews. Uh, what, what did they do? Did they decide, so you know what, we need to get with the Hebrew priests. How do we worship this God? Was that the solution for them? Well, what did they do? Get rid of it. Send it back where it came from. And so that's what we're going to look into next time. But unless God does that work in the heart, people will never desire the truth of God. And what happened even when they had the Lord Jesus Christ, there he was entering a, a, the, the kingdom, I think, of the Gadarenes. And there was this madman who was demon-possessed. I think there may have been two of them. I think there's two different accounts. So I think one, one has just one. The other mentions two. So what does he do? He casts out the demon. And the, the, the demons end up going into the swine. And, and the swine are run off into a cliff. What do, the, what do the people ask? Do they want to know? They see the man sitting there clothed in his right mind. Do they want the solution? Do they, they, they want to welcome the Lord Jesus Christ into their culture and teaching them and uh, uh, bringing to them the salvation that they know? No. What do they say? Please leave. They, they, they wouldn't throw him out physically. They knew better than to try to do that. They, they feared him, I'm sure. But they didn't want him. Unless God does that miracle in the heart, then we cannot see true revival. You know, I think that's what we're going to look at in the next time, let us pray.